taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Guy Georges The Beast of Bastille Guy Rampillon was born on the 15th of October, 1962, in Angers, France. His father was an American, George Carteright, who was a soldier who worked as a chef on the NATO bases. His mother was a French local. Unfortunately the baby boy was unceremoniously discarded by his parents when he was still very young. Guy was then taken in by the DAS, the French Social Welfare Service. He was then positioned with a foster family and at the age of six, to aid in his acceptance, Guy was given the surname Georges, this was the name of his adoptive father at the time. He was then adopted by the Maurins and grew up in a large family of 12 adopted children. The problem with a large family is that young Georges never really received the love, attention, and stability he needed. As he grew older, he soon began to show a violent and aggressive streak in his behavior. His first attack came at the age of 14, in the year of 1976. Georges had tried to throttle Rosaline one of his psychologically disabled adoptive sisters. Just two years later, he attacked another of his adoptive sisters, Christy Ann. Concerned for the welfare of her family, Mrs. Morin arranged for Georges to return to the authorities of the DAS. He was a danger to her burgeoning family and he was not welcome anymore. Positioned again in foster care it became clear that Georges was not capable of controlling his violent urges, and on 6 February 1979, he struck again. This time he attacked a girl, only known as Pascal C. During the attack Georges tried to choke her, but thankfully she managed to escape. He was later arrested by the police but was released after a week. Completely abandoned by his foster family. Georges became increasingly depressed and turned to alcohol for solace. A year later, the 17-year-old Georges viciously attacked a girl named Jocelyn in May 1980. Soon after that he assaulted Rosaline C., stabbing her aggressively in the face, an extremely violent and personal attack. Both girls survived their ordeals at the hands of Georges, and he was arrested again. This time he was sentenced for his crimes and went to prison for a year in Angers, located in the Loire region. Upon his discharge from prison, Georges moved to Paris with a friend, where he lived in squats in the east of the city. No one there assumed Georges of being the serial sexual offender that he was, he managed to keep his contrivances to himself. Georges committed petty crimes to survive the days, drank comprehensively, and befriended young people fascinated in left-wing politics. A month after his 19th birthday, Guy Georges committed his first rape. On 16 November, 1981, he attacked a neighbor named Natalie. She was just returning home at the time and in a frenzied attack he raped her, stabbed her, and left her for dead. Natalie thankfully survived the depravity. Following a five-month incarceration term for theft, Guy Georges attacked once again. On 7 June, 1982, in a car park of the 16th arrondissement, he raped, stabbed, and strangled Violette K. Luckily she managed to escape and went to the police. A few days later, Georges was detained and sentenced to another custodial sentence. This time it was 18 months in prison. Shortly after his latest release from prison, in February of 1984, Georges attacked 21-year-old Pascal in in a car park. Sticking with his usual modus operandi, he raped and stabbed the young lady viciously. Fortunately she managed to break free and run away. Later that evening, knowing exactly who they were looking for, police arrested Georges once again. In 1985, Guy Georges was sentenced at the Court of Assizes of Mutha and Moselle, to 10 years detention. Due to good conduct towards the end of his sentence however, Georges was allowed out of prison during the day, but was required to report back each evening to spend the night. This would be a glaring mistake on behalf of the French authorities. 
On the evening of the 24th of January, he simply did not report to prison and instead traveled to Paris to commit his first murder. Stalking the streets, Georges spotted an attractive young woman walking down the road. It was 19-year-old Pascal Escarfail, a student at the Sorbonne. Following her home, Georges grabbed her just as she was opening her front door, Pascal was mere feet away from safety. Holding a knife to her throat, Georges forced his way in, tied her up, and raped her. Then he slit her throat and watched her die. A week after the murder, Georges calmly returned to the prison as if nothing was amiss. Released from his lax incarceration on 4 April, 1992, Georges wasted no time in finding another young female victim. On the 22nd of April, 1992, he attacked Eleonore D., who escaped and reported the incident to the police. Georges was detained once more, and one would have thought that by now, the police would be weary of releasing the prolific sex attacker. Surely he was a permanent danger to the public. On the 7th of January, 1994, Georges attacked Catherine Rock, 27, in an underground parking garage. Here he was true to his form and raped and murdered his poor victim. A mere six days later, Georges struck again. The subject of this attack was a radio host, Annie whom he raped and murdered on the patio of her home during the 13th of January, 1994. George's next attack was on the 8th of November, 1994, this took place in the underground parking garage of 22-year-old Elsa Benetti's home, in the 13th arrondissement. Yet again the vile beast raped and killed her. A mere month later on the 10th of December, 1994, Georges raped and murdered Dutch architect Agnes Nijkamp, 33, in her home in the 11th arrondissement. It was now that the media began to report that there was a killer in East Paris. The capital was under attack. In June of 1995, Georges attacked Elizabeth O and tried to kill her, fortunately she made a narrow escape. On the 8th of July, 1995, Georges raped and murdered Helena Frinking, 27, in her apartment after she returned from an evening out. Next, Georges assaulted another young woman on 25 August 1995, this took place in the Marais Quarter. During this time some progress was being made in the police investigation into the killer of East Paris. However, whilst Elizabeth O had managed to give a vague description of her attacker, when shown a picture of George's she had failed to identify him. There was some forensic evidence though, police did have DNA traces left at two crime scenes by the same individual, and also a footprint found at the location of the Helena Franking crime. This was certainly something to kickstart a major investigation. In September of 1997, George's attacked and attempted to rape a woman by the name of Estelle F but she bravely fought him off and escaped. A few days later on the 23rd of September, 1997, the deviant Georges broke into the apartment of 19-year-old student, Magli Serati, here he raped and stabbed her to death. Days later and showing no appetite for respite, Georges assaulted Valerie L in the stairwell of her apartment block. Less than a month after that, Georges entered the home of Estelle Magd, 25, where he raped and murdered her on the 16th of November, 1997. This thankfully, was to be the last victim of the killer now known as, the Beast of Bastille. At this point the police investigation was finally gaining momentum and investigators knew for certain that several of their unsolved crimes were linked. This meant that they potentially had a serial killer on their hands. The media frenzy surrounding the killings had unleashed a level of panic in the population of Paris, and Georges was being dubbed the Beast of Bastille due to the reality that several of his attacks had occurred in the Bastille Quarter, the famed revolutionary era Parisian neighborhood. In what was one of the largest manhunts in French criminal history, police finally found Guy Georges in Montmartre, 
and arrested him on the 27th of March, 1998. They charged him for the rape and murder of Pascal Scarfale, Catherine Rock, Elsa Benedi, and Agnes Nijkamp. It transpired that George's DNA had matched that found at all four crime scenes, as well as at one attempted rape. Confronted whilst in custody with the irrefutable DNA verification, George's confessed to these four murders and asked for three others to be taken into consideration. Law enforcement were now happy they had their man. Whilst in custody, George's tried to escape in December 2000, a few weeks before his trial was due to begin. He and three cellmates attempted to saw through the bars of their cell, but were caught by prison guards. George's was assessed by psychiatrists and declared legally sane and fit to stand before a court. The three-week trial began on Monday the 19th of March, 2001. The 50 witnesses included four women previously attacked and raped by George's. Amongst those giving evidence were 15 experts, family members of some of George's victims, and George's own 71-year-old foster mother. Despite Prosecutor Eveline Lessier presenting the DNA evidence as well as the confession given after his arrest, Georges pleaded not guilty to all charges at the trial. He also retracted his confession, claiming the police had tortured and beaten him to obtain it. Eight days into the proceedings and the defeated Georges broke down in tears and confessed. He admitted to the original four murders, as well as to the rape and murder of Helena Franking in 1995, Magli Serati in 1997, and Estelle Magd in 1997. He then asked for forgiveness from the victims' families. On Thursday 5 April, 2001, Guy Georges, now 38, was sentenced to life imprisonment for the rape and murder of seven women between 1991 and 1997. This term was to be carried out without the possibility of parole for at least 22 years. The people of Paris were now safe. There were several people who believed that Georges should have been caught earlier and that some of his horrendous crimes could have thus been avoided. Throughout the police investigation, officers had failed to match DNA results for several months, and at least one murder was committed whilst Georges was on day release from prison. The intense focus on the case did have a positive effect however, in that this was the first case of using DNA evidence to convict a criminal in France. After the Georges case, French Minister of Justice Elizabeth Gigou, established the precedent of storing the DNA of all sex offenders in a national register. Georges is still a suspect in a few other murders previously considered part of the Bastille series. It is believed that he will never be released from prison as psychiatrists have described Georges as a narcissistic psychopath, and warned that his urge to kill could not be cured. There are some who believe he will commit suicide whilst in prison, as he was reported as saying. You can rest assured, I know that I will never leave prison but I can assure you that I will never serve my sentence, the sentence that you are going to impose on me is nothing. I will inflict a sentence upon myself. Unfortunately for him, the narcissistic psychopath will not be having the last word here. To this day, he languishes in the French penal system.